Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and we're jumping right into Unit 3 as we talk about the differences between intermolecular forces and intramolecular forces. Now in this unit, we are focusing on the intermolecular forces, but we need to know the difference between these two. Now generally speaking, we can say that intermolecular forces are the forces that make molecules stick together. And so this is different from intramolecular forces. Those are the forces inside an individual molecule or within an ionic compound that keeps the molecule or the, the compound uh, sticking together. So when we talk about intramolecular forces, we're specifically talking about covalent and ionic bonding for the most part. On the other hand, intermolecular forces are going to affect physical properties. Things like a boiling point or a melting point or surface tension or vapor pressure or something like that. On the other hand, when we talk about intramolecular forces, covalent and ionic bonding, that's going to affect how reactive or how unreactive the substance is. Usually, intermolecular forces are weaker than covalent and ionic bonds. And covalent and ionic bonds, of course, are going to be much stronger than intermolecular forces. So it's important to know the difference between these two types of forces. In this unit, we're mainly going to be focusing on the intermolecular forces. Now, we're going to focus in this video on a very fundamental type of intermolecular force. And these are called London dispersion forces. Now, sometimes they're just called London for forces. Sometimes they're just called dispersion forces. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call them London dispersion forces. These are not to be confused with Van der Waals forces. That's uh, kind of a, a label that can include these, but it, it's, it is different also. So don't get those confused. Let's imagine that we have an atom of neon. And in that atom, we're, of course, going to have 10 protons in the middle. I'm not going to worry about the neutrons because those don't have a charge. But we have these, these 10 electrons that are, for all practical purposes, uh, buzzing around in the electron cloud in their uh, energy levels and their sublevels and orbitals and what have you. And this is a, a fairly uh, typical distribution for the electrons of any atom or, to be honest, any compound as well. These electrons are distributed fairly evenly throughout the volume of the atom. Now, we know that electrons are always on the move. They're never sitting still. And so it's possible, very possible in fact, that at some point the electron distribution for neon is going to look more like this. And this is just a matter of statistics and probability that at some point these electrons are going to look like that, where they're all kind of uh, uh, positioned on one side of the atom or the molecule. And when this happens, this is called an, an instantaneous uh, dipole because we have a temporary lopsided distribution of the electrons here. And because of this, this is an instantaneous dipole. There's, there's nothing that's really caused this except for just the, the fact the electrons are always moving. And they just happen to be on one side at this particular moment in time. And because of that, we have this, this structure that temporarily has, has a positive pole. And so that's why this lowercase delta is here with the positive that, that represents the partial positive charge there. And then the delta negative over here represents the fact that we have all these electrons on this side, so that's a partial negative charge there for this atom. Now, this lopsidedness, this instantaneous dipole, can affect nearby structures. Let's imagine that we have another atom of neon over here, and it's, it's minding its own business. It's got its, its electrons fairly uh, evenly distributed, just like the last one had at a certain point. But if it's moving and it moves over here, guess what's going to happen to the electron distribution? Well, the fact that this atom over here has a positive, a partial positive charge is going to attract the electrons to that side of the atom. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to have 
something that looks like this. And so now this atom is going to have a partial negative charge and a partial positive charge as well. Now this, this is not just something that happened because of statistics and probability. This atom was induced to be like this because of its neighbor. We call this an induced dipole. And so this is different from the instantaneous dipole that we had on the first atom over there. So when you have an instantaneous dipole, it can cause kind of a, a chain reaction because when this atom does this, guess what its neighbor is going to do? Basically the same thing. Now, this is a London dispersion force. And all molecules exhibit this because at some point any molecule can have that instantaneous dipole where all its electrons are on one side and or almost all of them anyway and it can it cause a chain effect it actually can cause an attraction for those other atoms nearby this happens for all molecules it happens for all atoms it happens for all covalent molecules it happens for ionic compounds every single thing out there every substance exhibits these london dispersion forces however when you encounter a nonpolar molecule that we talked about at the end of unit two, well, guess what? Nonpolar non molecules only have London dispersion forces. And because of that, we usually focus on nonpolar molecules when we talk about LDFs, London dispersion forces. Uh, generally speaking, the more electrons that a molecule has, that means it's more polarizable. So more electrons, when they're all on one side, that's a stronger negative partial charge, making the other side stronger in its positive charge. And uh, therefore, the more electrons you have, the stronger the London dispersion forces are going to be. And like I said, that's the case for all molecules. They're most prominent in nonpolar molecules, but they, but they exist in all molecules the stronger the molecule's intermolecular forces, the higher its boiling point, the higher its melting point is going to be. Uh, you know, generally speaking, we say that London dispersion forces are the weakest type of intermolecular force. However, some molecules actually have so many electrons and are so polarizable that their intermolecular forces end up being stronger than some polar molecules. Now, an example of this is a polymer. Think of plastic. Uh, plastic basically involves a polymer that's fairly long, a fairly large molecule, and these are nonpolar molecules. So they don't have a pole to them, but they have so many electrons because they're such large molecules that they have stronger intermolecular forces than even something like, like water. Uh, and so that's why plastic you have to raise the temperature fairly high to get plastic to melt, and some polymers even higher than that. So let's take a look at an example now. Which of these molecules exhibits London dispersion forces? Now, I don't think this is a trick question. I just got done saying that all molecules exhibit London dispersion forces. So guess what? Both of these do. So don't let something like that trick you. All molecules, all substances exhibit those LDFs. Now, what if I were to ask which one exhibits stronger London dispersion forces? Now that's, that's something that you can figure out. Whichever one has more electrons. And you can actually look at the periodic table and, and you, can, you can add these up, but I think most of you can probably eyeball this and see that this uh, butane molecule here is going to have more electrons than the methane molecule. And we can confirm this by looking at the boiling points. We see that the boiling point of butane is well over 200 degrees Celsius higher than the boiling point of methane because its London dispersion forces are incredibly weak. Now, let's do one more exercise here. Let's rank these nonpolar molecules in order of increasing boiling point. Now, how do you do that? Well, think about polarizability. The more polarizable it has, the higher its boiling point. 
the less polarizable it is, the lower its boiling point. Now, less polarizable means it has fewer electrons. Which of these has the fewer electrons? Well, you can look at your periodic table and see that helium will have the fewest. So it's got the lowest boiling point. Which one is next? Well, you can look at your periodic table, see that argon has about 18 electrons. This propane molecule has about, let's see, uh, 18 plus 8, about 26. So that means that argon would be next. And then propane has the most number of electrons, so it has the most polarizability and the highest boiling point. And guess what? We can look up these boiling points online or in the literature, and we can see that our predictions are absolutely correct. So we can predict relative boiling points of nonpolar molecules by looking at the number of electrons they have. I hope you learned something about London dispersion forces here. Go ahead and give me a thumbs up if you did, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in our next section as we continue on to, to looking at more types of intermolecular forces in our next video for Unit 3, Section 1.